Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. And our first item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you'd like to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, we'll do that together. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, of States, the United America, States of America and to the, and republic, to the republic for which it stands, which it stands one, nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible with liberty, and, liberty justice for all. and justice for all. Well, that will actually be fun to do together when we're back in person. Okay. All right. So for our September 28th meeting, Tracy, are you at your um, reporting live from an alternate location? Could you do the roll call for us? Yes. Reporting live from the uh, Trustee Bowser. Here. Trustee Rapaz. Here. Trustee Vanderhyde. She is excused. She had a prior appointment. Gilmore. Here. Mr. Plager, here. Vice President Schaffner. Here. President Reed. Here. Thank you. And we have established a quorum. So we'll move on to our adoption of the agenda. And I would entertain a motion. Is somebody else hearing that? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. It quit. All right, so we have a motion and a second for the adoption of the agenda. Is there any discussion? Having none, Vice President Schaffner? Yes. Secretary Slager? Yes. Treasurer Gilmore? Yes. Trustee Rivard? Yes. Trustee Bowser? Yes. President Reed? Yes, the agenda is adopted as presented. Is, some, is that someone's background noise? Somebody needs to mute, maybe? I think Tracy's on the side of the freeway. <laughs> okay. All right, it's better now. Okay, so whatever that was, we'll just be aware of it. Okay, so gratitudes. Anybody have gratitude? I'll start. I'm grateful for every day that we're open or we're connected virtually and for the Red Hawk Weekly that keeps me organized. From Scott. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I'll say uh, Ellie was sick last week and I, I think it's me, it might be me. Okay. I think it is. But um, Ellie was sick last week in the middle school for eighth grade and in the Yellow House, the teachers were fantastic. They were so accommodating for taking tests and everything. So I just want to do a shout out that I appreciate that so much. So that's my gratitude. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I'm thankful for the team of contributors to that Red Hawk Weekly. Um, and just for the can-do spirit that keeps uh, keeps us buoyant and keeps us afloat during these challenging times. And uh, I'll jump in here to Chris. Well, hey, I'm grateful for him. He put together a, what, 27-page production for us for tonight. Um, you know, I just appreciate the heck out of what you're doing. It's, uh, it's a difficult thing to pay attention to all these numbers as they're changing hourly almost, I believe. Uh, and to put something together that guides us and helps us to know where we've been, where we're going, and what we might be able to expect. So I'm grateful for that. Thanks, Chris. I'm thankful for uh, the time. I had, a, had I'm thankful for the opportunity to have a conversation with Chris today. Uh, and I know he, we're going to get a chance to get more Chris as he talks about this stuff. But uh, he shared uh, that he took some time Friday to spend some family time. And I thought it was a great reminder that really, uh, you know, the teachers and the administration and us, you know, we, we give a lot of time, but making sure that we take that time to do work-life balance and celebrate the moments with our families too. So uh, I thought uh, it was a good conviction. Appreciate uh, Chris's wise words. So thank you for that. Agree. All right. 
we'll move on. I don't see any other indicators there. So next we have our consent agenda. So I'd entertain a motion to approve as it's presented. So moved. Support. Vice President Schaffner. Yes. Secretary Slager. Yes. Treasurer Gilmore. Yes. Dusty Rivard. Yes. Trustee Bowser. Yes. President Reed. Yes, the consent agenda is approved. And we have on for discussion, our second read for our extended COVID-19 learning plan with Jen Haberling. And it is up for action tonight. Yep, and Stacy is with us tonight as well in case you have any questions about portions of this. Um, I'm to slide from last week that, or last time, uh, that kind of goes through the difference between the two plans. Um, so you'll see in my screen, oh, my internet connection is unstable. That's always exciting. There we go. Um, maybe. Okay, there we go. Um, so you'll see just that this uh, plan by um, executive order asks us to give some assurances about the work that we will do this year regarding transparency, educational goals, benchmark assessments, instructional delivery, equitable access, and attendance. And that is different from our plan regarding safety, health, and mental health that we presented in um, early August for approval. So any questions that you might have, really this is just saying that uh, once a month as we gather, we will review the plan, take any public comment that we have and report out on our attendance. Um, we've made just a couple of very uh, simple changes. So in our um, reconfirmation meeting, we are asked to explain how is going to be delivered, any modifications that we've made to the extended plan. So we would love to hear from you at that point about the thing that you're hearing as you're out and about that might be good for us to consider as we go into the next month. We would document public comment. And then this used to say review two week um, communication rates for Cedar Trails and that was how attendance is to be documented if students are virtual part of the attendance code is that um, either they are seen in person in a seat in a classroom or in a zoom room or there's documentation that they've turned in some kind of an assignment that also con is considered attendance especially if they are virtual or there's a documented two-way communication between um, a mentor, a teacher, a person at the school, and that student relating to their academics. So after some conversation at our district office level, we decided really just to change that to weekly attendance rates rather than distinguish just the two-way communication piece. We would hope that we would have, you know, a high percentage both for um, our Red Hawk online students and for our traditional students. And that's the other simple change that we made right here. This used to say um, fully virtual or 100% virtual. And instead we changed it to Red Hawks Online because that's the name of our virtual school. So we wanna track attendance for those students by the week. And then instead of traditional, it used to say not 100% virtual. So we decided to change that instead to our traditional model of what we would offer. And that would be the students who've chosen in-person instruction, but for whatever reason, we may be required to have out for health and safety reasons, or if an entire building or grade level or classroom is, is shut down. So we would not report those students as online students because they've chosen our traditional model. We would report them with the traditional. So those were two very simple changes that we made just in terms of um, clarifying who we're talking about and what we're talking about. And then the other piece of this is really um, our benchmark assessment reporting. And uh, 
our goals that we set forth um, that all students would be improving from now till mid-year and from mid-year to the end of the year. Um, we will report beginning of the year data. We're not required necessarily to report all three, but we'd like to, and we'll be sending parent reports home with those benchmark um, data points for parents to consider as well. So what questions might you have about any of this reporting that is required through the executive order? How do you want us to give us um, anything that we've heard? Do you want us to email that to you? Do you want us to do that in the meeting? Or what were you thinking around that, Jen? Mm -hmm. So I would appreciate hearing in real time what you're hearing out and about um, through an email. That would be great and would help drive our work as we're meeting regularly together in different teams. Um, we will also hear from our administrative team what's working, what's not working, what needs to be adjusted, and we'd like to bring that to you also as recommendations from the team and from the stakeholders, teachers, um, and students that we're hearing might need to be adjusted. Um, but this is, you know, really about um, we're offering in person and online, and there's a schedule for both of those things, and here's how we're planning to do it. Um, we know this is tremendously challenging work for our teaching staff right now uh, and some big adjustments that they're making and um, we're doing our best to support that work and make sure that they have the right channels um, for communicating some of their concerns and their needs so that we can best support them. But anything that you're hearing out in the community, I would also like to hear um, just to be able to know. So for example, Heidi, I know that you shared a concern about the iReady test. Um, and that gave us an opportunity to really look closely at what was happening in an online setting when, when um, students are taking that. Parents, well intended, are helping their students, which causes the level of the test to continue to climb because it's computer adaptive. And so no one's doing this to try to you know, cheat the system or anything like that. They just are seeing their child struggle in a way that maybe they haven't when they're in the classroom because parents don't typically get to see that, that um, productive struggle that happens as students are learning. So any, any concerns like that that you're hearing, it gives us the chance to clarify and um, help people to, to know what's going on and then to adjust if we need to. Okay, so board, so we would email that to Jen and as we always do, we would um, CC Scott as well. So he's in the loop. And I clarified that, yep. Jen, so we are going to Jen because keeping our protocol here, so. <laughs> For sure, and then if it's something related to special services or student services, that would go through Stacy. So I've I've been noticing from some social media things. I do appreciate, and I want to say this to Stacy. It appears um, we've reached out sooner than maybe some other districts. Maybe not anybody locally um, as far as getting uh, things going for our, our special ed students. So thank you for that. And my other question is. Um, PSATs, or I'm going to say the wrong alphabet soup wrong, but those tests I read somewhere are not mandatory. Mm -hmm. they're, they're suggested. So with the heightened anxiety of parents and students and everything, I just wondered how, where are we on that? Or what's our, what's our thinking on that? Um, our high school staff met and determined that the best way to move forward with that was to encourage and offer it to students, especially given that some of those tests are used for gatekeepers to um, other life experiences like college or scholarship. We wanted to help students understand that this would be something that would be beneficial for you to take. Um, it's not held, we're not held um, accountable to that data this fall test date. Uh, so we're offering it because we want to offer that to our students and um, they'll be given the opportunity to take it in mid-October. Okay. Those were my questions. I'll open up to the board if you have any other clarifying questions or thoughts. Okay. I, we don't. So, 
Great. So that'll be on for action. And then um, at one of our October board meetings, we'll begin to report the data to you as well for, from an attendance standpoint. And then also we'll have our benchmark data um, more finalized than the data that was shared in the Red Hawk Weekly. Okay. And do I need to sign that or is that just a formality? Okay. I believe you do need to sign that. Okay. All right. I'll just do that. I'll probably just do it. Well, we'll handle that later. Okay. Moving on. Okay, so that's our only discussion item. So we'll move on to public comments. And Scott, I don't know if you've received anything ahead of time for anybody that wanted to address the board. We do have one attendee with us. Um, this would be the time to, for your three minutes to address the board. If you didn't want to do it in this format, of course our emails are always open for those types of things. Are we seeing any indicators that our attendee would like to speak? No indicators, and I did not re receive anything prior to the meeting. Okay. We will continue on then for our action item, which we just discussed. So I would look to entertain a motion for our extended COVID-19 learning plan to be approved as presented. So moved. Second, support. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Okay, having none, Vice President Schaffner? Yes. Secretary Slager? Yes. Treasurer Gilmore? Yes. Trustee Rivard? Yes. Trustee Bowser? Yes. President Reed, yes. We get to continue into the future because we now have that formal plan as the state says we shall. So thank you for that work, Stacey and Jim, and everybody that contributed. All right, that brings us to the work session portion of our meeting and we're all at our uh, comfortable spots. So we won't be going to our rolly chairs or our round table. We'll just round table away right here. So first up, I'll let you introduce this, Scott. You go with the first one. Mute it, mute it, Scott. Oh. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chris LaHaye is here to uh, provide us with a business and financial services quarterly update. So I'll turn it over to Chris. Hey, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, um, yeah, I wanted to give you guys an update uh, of what's been happening in the last month or so uh, of everything surrounding, you know, finances and uh, start, we'll start big picture with the consensus revenue estimating conference, which happened over a month ago, which is just crazy. And then I've got a little bit of more updated information. Uh, quite a bit of information came out at the end of last week regarding uh, 21 budget. So you'll see that. And then just a few other things uh, here as we move through it. So without further ado, um, Okay, I can get this to move. There we go. So the uh, consensus revenue estimating conference took place on August 24th. Uh, again, this looks at a big picture US and Michigan um, outlook for the economy. And the great thing about it was uh, the news was much better than the May revenue estimating conference uh, outlook. So we'll start in the US. Uh, and I just kind of wanted to go through a little bit of where we've been since COVID started. Monthly pay, payroll jobs, this is millions of people in the US. About 22 million jobs were lost nationwide uh, as a result of the pandemic. The good news is, um, and that was through March and April, uh, through July, so May, June, and July, we recovered about 9.3 million of those jobs. So nearly 50% of those jobs were back and, and that's what this graph shows. So the recovery, uh, we were hoping for a V-shaped recovery and at this point, it, at least looks like uh, we're headed in that direction. So it's good news. Um, retail sales, this is one, and again, the consensus revenue es estimating conference was something that spanned hours and hours and hours. So I'm just giving you a snapshot of some of, I think the more telling slides that lead us to where um, you'll see the budget come in at here uh, towards the end of this presentation. If you look at the monthly retail sales and food services, again, this is nationwide, this is in the US. Um, it's pretty remarkable to see that V-shaped type of comeback uh, really dipped right down and came right back up. So 
um, there's a cautionary tale here. The federal government pumped in about a half a trillion uh, dollars in unemployment and stimulus checks, which has definitely helped that recovery. Uh, and so that's some of the caution that we see as well. But it's at least uh, good to see that after a V-shaped dip, we're right back to where we were in the same trajectory. And it's worth mentioning that in August of 2020, uh, retail and food sales were up 2.6% from August of 2019. So it's almost as if uh, pandemic hadn't happened. Um, another thing, this is all the University of Michigan's uh, research and seminar on quantitative economics. Um, they consider a lot of things when they're, they're going and making their projections uh, for what the budget and revenues will look like. And I won't read through all of these, but basically, um, you know, they looked at a lot of the results of people getting infected, have a strong immune response, showing that it's, it's not likely to have a significant reinfection rate. Um, the vaccine pipeline looks very promising. Um, and the expectations there at the end is that uh, modest mitigation measures stay in place for a while. We're going to continue to wear masks, but um, the public health outlook looks favorable, at least. So it's, it's good to see, and it's, it's uh, adding to the positive outlook, I would say. Monetary policy, same thing. The Fed funds rate at zero since March in the forecast window. Basically, it's, it's cheap to, to borrow money right now. Um, and, and that's a good thing. So, um, you know, banks pass that to other banks. They pass that to lender or to, uh, you know, borrowers. And it's easy to, uh, to keep the economy going. There's a massive liquidity and market functioning support. Um, a lot of the or direct uh, lending programs A lot of that relief still is not being completely taken advantage of, and and so there's a lot of cash out there to be, to be uh, to be taken advantage of in programs. Um, negative interest rates are extremely unlikely. That's great. That means banks can borrow money, and that means that they're not going to pass on higher interest rates to consumers. So a lot of positives there on the monetary policy side as well. Um, you see the market interest rates again. This kind of shows the forecast of 21 and 22 as well as where we are now. The conventional mortgage a couple of years ago was inching up to 5%, dipped down 2.77% right about now. You see that's, that's projected to stay low. But the flip side of that is that uh, this is why we're not earning much on our investments as a school district, because you can see the 10-year treasury note and the three-month bill uh, staying low, projected to stay very low. So basically, you're not going to be earning a lot on your, on your interest dollars uh, for the next several years, according to these projections. So it's a give and a take as far as interest rates go. There's a surprising lack of urgency. As I mentioned earlier with that V-shaped, um, I guess, swing back uh, as far as retail sales and food, conventional you know, wisdom is that that was as a result of a lot of relief, over half a trillion dollars into unemployment and, and stimulus checks. They're saying a lot more is needed, and the last bill was in early June. We're not going to see anything else in the way of, of stimulus or anything of that nature until after the election. And of course, there's a whole lot to do with that that I'm not going to go into, and it'll depend on who the president is and, and what happens in Congress. So um, the overwhelming, I guess, consensus is that more relief is going to be needed if we are going to continue to have this type of recovery because we've, uh, you know, had a lot of that and it's inflated consumer spending. Moving quickly through this, just to give an outlook, um, GDP growth, it's important to notice this is in percent and this is again, the US as a whole. Uh, this basically, the pandemic basically wiped out the last two years of GDP growth um, in this country. But the good news is, if you wanna look at it in good news, uh, from the good, good side of things, is that we're projected to gain that back in the next two years. So uh, the, the yellow bars are the annual real GDP growth. And then you can see uh, the quarterly real GDP growth is the, is the line here. And that kind of shows us how much of a trend, really jagged it is, but it's going to level out as we move through 21 and 22 based on the projections. Um, in billions of, of dollars, same thing. They call this a, uh, this is not a V-shaped, this is not a V-shaped recovery. This is called a, uh, 
a uh, check mark, I believe. They call this a check mark recovery because you can see the very drastic drop off in GDP. Again, value of goods and services produced in the United States uh, over a period of time being a year or more quarterly. But then the recovery is quick and is going to level off. So it's going to be quite some time, two years or so, before we get back to pre pandemic GDP, according to the University of Michigan's projection. Again, this all plays into to our forecast and school aid fund um, that we'll see here in a minute. Another reason for optimism, uh, again, with, with their projections, is even though COVID cases have increased and continue to rise since uh, the summer months, since June, you can see the increase, uh, the new COVID deaths are staying pretty low. Uh, so again, this, is, this can get political and I'm just showing you the graphs of, of where, we, where we are um, relative to those numbers. So that's a positive, that's how the University of Michigan views it. Um, this one was worth mentioning, I think just, uh, I found it very interesting personally, that Michigan is actually outpacing the rest of the United States uh, in consumer spending since the pandemic. You can see that in the third month of 2020, so right before the pandemic, we were lower than the national average. And since April, we've outpaced the rest of the country, um, or at least in, you know, in average, the rest of the country. The main reason for that, um, maybe we're doing a better job. Uh, I've heard that Michigan's unemployment uh, response has been better than a lot of other states. Uh, we have a great work share program and perhaps just uh, general optimism in the state of Michigan that we are you know, going to get through this virus and have it under control has led to that as well. Also, the summer months is our main tourist season here, so that's going to contribute as well. Um, whereas in the winter months, you might see southern states really outpace Michigan. So just interesting. Um, the unemployment found very interesting here. You can see the major spike that occurred uh, right at the pandemic. Um, I wrote this down. We were about 3.9% before the COVID pandemic struck. We reached a height of 19.9% and it's trickled down. Uh, it was 8.7% in July and the forecast is to be around 9% in the third quarter and 8.6% in the fourth quarter of this year. You can see that the projection is it's going to take well past 2022 to get back anywhere close to our pre-pandemic unemployment rate, uh, but time will tell. Um, annual job growth in Michigan, the fast recovery industries really have outpaced the slow recovery industries. Fast recovery, our manufacturing, healthcare, the things that are essential have jumped right back up um, and are outpacing things such as leisure, hospitality, um, those other services, retail, and those will be a slower uh, type of recovery. However, um, within the next year or so, projected to get back to pre-pandemic um, growth. That gets me through the state, or I'm sorry, the University of Michigan's um, outlook on, on where we're going to end up. This is the Department of Treasury, actually. They were a little bit more... Um, let's say about their, uh, their positive outlook, but still um, had a generally overall, you know, this is much better than what we thought it was going to be type of, type of view of things. Michigan was hit harder than, uh, from this recession. Uh, they said uh, the US lost one in eight jobs as a result of the pandemic, Michigan lost one in four. Um, so pretty significant, but again, the recovery is, is taking place. It will take many years, and um, you know they're forecasting that modest economic recovery will continue. Uh, state revenue collections really have been a very, um, I guess, unexpected and pleasant surprise. Payroll jobs were down about 16.8 percent, but if you look at this, major tax revenue, income tax withholding actually increased by almost four um, percent, and sales tax was only down 270 million dollars. Um, which I say only about $270 million versus the May consensus revenue estimating conference. It's pretty significantly uh, better than what we thought. So um, I'll run right through that one. I'm actually going to skip this one and jump on and get to our general fund and school aid fund uh, forecast. So these show some bars. The January consensus revenue estimating conference um, is the lightest bar to the left. 
and then May, where things were looking very, very, very rough, is in the middle. And then you see the August recommendation on the right of each one of these bars for 2020, 2021, and 2022. Uh, so, you know, in January, things were looking great. You know, the governor came out and the school aid fund was going to be healthy, large per pupil increase. Um, and if you look at this for 2020, uh, we're, we're much closer to that January projection than uh, I think anybody would have thought. So very healthy, 21 and 22, especially 21. Again, that's the result of, you know, no stimulus money potentially or much less is going to be a harder hit. Uh, but again, time will tell. And at least for now, there is money in the school aid and the general fund to, to fund a lot of programs. So that was the general fund. This is the school aid fund. And you can see the January crack had $13.9 billion for the school aid fund. August came in at $13.7 billion. So really very close for this fiscal year, which is remarkable uh, based on where we thought we were going to be. Um, <clears throat> this really tells the tale. Um, and again, can you guys see my cursor? Oh, that's the wrong computer. I've got four screens. How about this one right here? Can you guys see that? Yep. This just kind of really shows the numbers on that previous slide. And again, this is the one that really is telling to me 13.9 billion. Um, and here we're at 13.7. So just truly remarkable. Next year, we'll see we're about $800 million shy of where we were in January, but a lot can change. So that's the August revenue forecast comparison. Uh, forecast risks, uncertainty. We don't exactly know where the pandemic is going. We don't know what the short and long-term impacts will be. Uh, will there be more federal stimulus uh, to boost the economy? We don't know. And then uh, as far as Michigan goes, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, with jobs and consumer spending. Again, really recovered quickly. What's it going to look like? Is that sustainable? Time will tell. That really was the idea of the uh, Consensus Revenue Estimating Conference. I apologize for running through it so quickly, uh, but I really want to get to these last six slides or so because I think they're most important. Um, so this one, I, I, I asked the question, was the August Consensus Revenue Estimating Conference too conservative? Uh, this came out uh, on September 11th, so just a few weeks ago, and I just think it's worth putting on here and noting uh, that the school aid fund revenue for Michigan's major taxes um, what came in at 38.2 million above what they established in the CREC. So, uh, you know, it was a good forecast for the school aid fund and really for the general fund. And then we exceeded it in August once we got the numbers uh, a few weeks later. So worth looking at, you know, I'm optimistic. I, I think I, uh, I was jumping for joy in Matt Blood's office last week briefly uh, when, when, we got news that there wasn't going to be significant cuts to education this year. And, uh, and then I came back to my office and made this slide. Uh, so the fiscal 2021 budget is getting clearer. We're going to have an amendment soon because we need one. Uh, it was just announced last week. I'm not sure what everybody's uh, awareness of this is, but the foundation allowance of $8,111 per pupil is going to remain intact. Um, this is a significant change. If you recall back to June, uh, we passed a budget that forecasted a $550 per pupil uh, decrease, which uh, you know at the time was conservative based on what the revenues looked like they were gonna come in. That's a restoration of almost $2 uh, million in our budget. So pretty, pretty significant. And we'll have updated numbers for you uh, within the next few months, really from an amendment standpoint. We're also gonna receive a one-time appropriation of $65 per pupil. Uh, based on a blend, which I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes here, that's an increase of $230,000 uh, for the district. So that's, you know, significant as well. Categorical appropriations, at-risk funding, special ed, uh, English language learners, um, early literacy coaches, uh, which are all very important to what we do here. Those are going to remain intact, which is just really, 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 really cool and just a great thing for our students as we move through the 21 uh, school year. And then I know nobody probably cares about this uh, as much as I do, but an increase in MIPSR support, that's the Michigan Public Schools um, retirement uh, system. We continue to fund that, uh, that system and, and we'll take that help from the state to help do that. So they, had, uh, they had announced an increase in what we pay towards the retirement pension system. Now we'll get some extra support, which is great. So, um, that's 
the 2021 budget what we know at this point. Before I transition, um, now I'm gonna go a little bit into counting student membership. Just to explain this, this kind of piggybacks off what Jen had because we're going to count membership much different this year uh, than in years past. Uh, so there's, there's something called the super blend, um, which that's not my lingo, that's actually what they came out and called it. The state aid, so our state aid will actually be calculated using 75% of last year's membership and 25% of this year's membership. So what this looks like is last year's membership was based on 10%, and this is every year, 10% of the spring count from the previous year and 90% of the current fall count. So this is again, the 1920 fiscal year. Okay, so our blended fall count or our blended uh, general membership count, 3,569 students, 3,569 FT. That's what we received funding on last year. Okay, so this year, and again, our spring 2020 count, that's finalized, that happened last February, came at 3,553. All right, I had Chrissy in our office run me the numbers out of power school for our current fall count, if count day was today, and we're at 3,481, which is a decrease. But again, we're gonna take that, we're gonna, oops, I got a little bit out of order there. That's gonna be blended on 10% and 90% once again, to give us a blend of 3,488. We're gonna take that 3,569 from last year, that's gonna count for 75% and 25% will be of our 3,488 from this year and get us a super blend of 3,549. So that is how we are going to work uh, or uh, count enrollment this year based on the state's uh, guidance. Now what that means to the district, that's an increase of um, 63,000 from last fiscal year. And the reason from that, for that is really, uh, you know, the number of students has, went, has gone down, but we received that extra $65 per student. So there's actually going to be an increase uh, from, uh, in, in funding from 3,569 students to 3,549, if that makes sense. Because uh, we're, down, we're down 20 students, but we'll actually have an increase in the funding. Now, if we didn't, this one is, is extremely important. And, and thanks, a big thanks to the state of Michigan for doing the super blend for us. The increase, if we did not have the super blend, if we were just basing our, our enrollment off traditional years, we would have five, almost $500,000 less, okay? So if we based our membership and our revenue off 3,488 instead of off 3,549, we would have $494,000 more, or I'm sorry, less. Now, at that point, I'll entertain any questions you may have. I'm not quite done yet, but I, it makes sense in my head, but does anyone have any questions about how this works or anything from the- If I could add one quick thing, Chris, one of yeah. the things that the state recognized transitioning from last year to this year was that many families would be, um, considering an online, or excuse me, a um, homeschool experience for their students, rather than um, going with an online option. And so the state didn't want um, uh, districts to be penalized uh, by a loss of students on a temporary status. And so that's one of the reasons why they implemented the super blend model for count. Absolutely. And we've seen that, thanks Scott. We've seen that on a lot of families that have, have you know, not come back. They've said, we're gonna homeschool for this year. We're just uneasy. And they've even said, we'll be back. So, all right. So we'll be receiving foundation allowance for the 3549 number, but we have 3480, oh, here we go, 3481 students. Correct. So our student foundation allowance for our district will actually be higher than the 8111. Is that correct? Yeah, that's one way of looking at it, Jeff. Absolutely. Based on the super blend, yes. Yep. So are those, 
those are extra dollars. Will we account for those uh, on a per student basis, basis differently or it just goes into the budget and those are dollars that are available for us? That's exactly it. It's just gonna go into the budget and those will be dollars that we have available to help offset some of the extra costs. I think some of it is a recognition of what Scott spoke about, but also, I mean, the cost of doing business this year, even though there has been extra funds for COVID related uh, you know, expenses, um, the cost of doing business this year and to educate each student has gone up for school districts. So I think that that helps as well. And I might add that there's actually, and I didn't include it in this because it doesn't pertain to us, there is extra dollars in the budget for districts that are still growing in enrollment. There are still some districts, even in Kent County, that are seeing increases. And so there will be, because the, you know they're, they're kind of on the back end of this, so there will be extra right. dollars for them. All right, yeah. thank you. You bet. All right, moving forward, I've just got a few more. Um, in a previous board meeting, I think it was a month ago at the work session, uh, someone had asked me about, you know, do we have an idea of our COVID-related grant revenue and costs and how they compare? So um, I won't run through these. Uh, we've, I've spoken to you about, uh, about most of them. We received uh, five different categories. Well, I'm sorry. So far, we've received three different categories, the ESSER funds, the district COVID costs, and then coronavirus relief funds to the tune of what our allocations are there to the right. Um, there's another one known as the ESSER equity funds that, that we've applied for, but we have no guarantee of getting because we are not, we don't meet the criteria, uh, but we could receive up to $56,000 uh, for that. And we've applied, we'll know within the next month or so if we received it. And then Kent County is actually uh, releasing some grant funds to school districts. So we'll, we'll receive just shy of 60,000 from Kent County. Uh, brings our total for COVID related expenses or COVID related revenue for the use of COVID related expenses to $1.4 uh, million, which is pretty substantial, obviously, and we can use those for any a large number of things. And I put together a list, and I know this is small, and I'm certainly not going to run through it, um, of just all the COVID related expenses that, uh, that we have um, endured in this school year. Some of this is, is kind of projected. I've, I've extrapolated some costs uh, just based on some of our orders. Um, so again, this is in the, in the meeting minutes and I can certainly send this to anybody that would like to see it. Uh, but you've got the PPE up there and I've just, you know, again, just thrown numbers at what I think this will cost to, to run the school year. Obviously we have all the technology that we've bought, wireless hotspots, Chromebooks, certified staff laptops, our curriculum providers uh, for the online school and the Canvas software, and then some staffing and professional development expenses we've had as well, such as nursing, I should say, uh, healthcare aides in each building, um, extra floating subs. So really just a lot of things that we can really say, these are because of the COVID pandemic. And our expenses come in at 1.8 million. And I think that's a little bit high if I had to really you know, project, but that just gives you an idea of, uh, you know, we've received quite a bit of COVID specific revenue and it's not really that too far out of line with where our COVID expenses are probably going to come in at. So this is something I have to track. We have grant codes for all of this. We'll have a much clearer picture as we move through the year, but just to give you guys a snapshot of what that looks like, I just wanted to provide that to the board. Uh, and then I believe my final slide I just wanted to mention this from a standpoint, um, this is getting a little bit outside, but Jen had mentioned about the, uh, we'll be reporting to you guys about attendance. It's required as part of the e-call plan. Uh, so we'll have to report to you weekly attendance for the traditional and then for the RHO students. Um, and there's three different buckets in which we have to really focus on attendance this year. It's just really, really new learning and, and a little bit different than, than ever before. So. Count day is Wednesday, October 7th. That's when we need to show that students are present. If they're in person or online, we can show that they're, they're there and, and mark them as there. We can also um, show attendance through the completion of assignment, lesson, or activity for each class on count day and receive you know, uh, funding or membership for that. If we don't have either of those things, we have to do what's known as this two-way academic interaction. Um, and so we have to do at least one per week for the four week count period in order to count them. The state of Michigan, typically we have to have 75% attendance on any given day 
or else we have to go back and make up that day. Um, they did away with that this year. Now we have to have 75% attendance in any one given month. Okay, and we can meet that attendance for any one of the, by any one of those same standards, uh, but we only have to have one two-way interaction per month or attendance with 75% of our students and the district will receive full funding. If we don't for a month and we can't prove it, we'll lose one twelfth of our funding. So the, you know, the stakes are pretty high, but it's very attainable. And then finally, for the extended COVID-19 learning plan, which you're going to see starting uh, you know, in our report, and we have to put it on the website as well, 75% of students have to have two two-way interactions per week. Very out of line with the attendance requirement from the state to keep our funding. Uh, but you'll see this, we're going to, to, uh, to publish the rate of our two-way interactions. So that was what Jen was showing on the table. So a lot of new, uh, ways to count membership uh, that you'll see reported to you this year. And that's how we're going to do it. So any questions for me? That's the end of my presentation. Chris, I've got a couple for you. Sure. Um, first of all, you mentioned the uh, state of Michigan is putting money into the retirement plan program. Uh, yes. And you were excited about that. Do we see any relief? because of their input or that just, uh, you know, or when will we see relief because of their input? Um, you know, that's a great question. So every year they ratchet up the amount that, uh, that districts have to, you know, contribute to that. And it's, it's about 27 and a half percent this year. It's projected to be fully funded. The pension system is, is projected to be fully funded by 2038. <laughs> so we're a long ways away. Um, so, and nobody can give you a straight answer on, okay, if we, once we get to 2038, what happens then? Does it go right back down to 5%? We don't know. So I can't tell so you, that number, doesn't, yeah, that number doesn't back it up a year to 2037. We don't have any idea what that number means other than they're putting more in there. They're putting more in. That's just it. And there's really, I mean, there's just so many ways that they do it. You know, we, we spend a lot of our money, um, to do it, but they flow money through us. Uh, it's known as this UAAL, you know, where they, they flow millions of dollars through the district. We record it as revenue and then we record it as an expense. It goes in and out. So gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. another 18 uh, years. Two, the number two, the foundation allowance is set again for uh, 8111, yep. uh, $8,111. Can they change that come the end of the year? <laughs> you know, last year I would have told you no. Uh, but they changed it on us last year. So I think anything is possible. You know, we did receive that, uh, that 175 uh, reduction last year per student, uh, which they announced in August, you know, obviously once the school year was done. So I think that if the projections stay true and, you know, there's not a huge downturn uh, in, the, in the revenues, then we'll be safe. But uh, yeah, it's, it, anything's possible. It's crazy. Right. So, so we have a proceed with caution clause in your budget somewhere. You know, are we, are we being extra conservative because of that? You know, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I wouldn't say that we're being extra conservative, but we're also being mindful. Um, you know, we, we've, we've had those extra COVID cost dollars and we've used those to, to purchase a lot of those extra, extra expenses and the professional development. Um, the nice thing is, is that the district has a great fund balance. Um, and so I think if we continue to be fiscally responsible, like we all are, we have, I have really no concerns. So, and again, I will have a much clearer picture. Um, and my plan is to give you guys a couple different scenarios with the amendment, much like I did in June with the, the final budget uh, to say, hey, this is what it'd look like if we had a, you know, uh, no reduction. This is what it would look like if we had a $550 reduction. So yeah, we'll continue to be mindful, know that we're kind of on shaky ground, but uh, there's reason to be um, excited and optimistic, I would say. So yeah, we're being, we're, I think we're being good stewards of public dollars at this point. We're doing everything we can to honor the work that's being done and, uh, you know, make sure that students have what they need. All right. And then finally, interest rates being as low as they are, and it looks like they're going to be low for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to answer a question, but looking forward, would there be a time that we might borrow money for our 
buildings prior to actually needing it because of the interest uh, benefit we might gain. And again, I'm not going to ask you to answer that, but just keep that in mind. Yeah, it's a that's a fair question. That's a real fair question. Um, and if you don't want me to answer, I won't. But uh, it, that's one of those things. I mean, as far as selling bonds, yeah, you don't want to sell them until you need that money because even though interest rates are low, you're still paying right. money on. It. Yeah, you are right. And and there's a limit. Out. You've got a limit as to when those dollars have to be spent. So you that's don't right. want to have the money in hand before you can do the work. Um, that's absolutely oh, true. Okay. So we just have to be really cautious around construction timelines. Um, materials availability. Um, so you have to be very strategic. Yep. But we're, I'm, continuing to, I'm continuing to look for, uh, you know, opportunities for refundings and ways that we can save taxpayers dollars yeah, whenever we can. So that's something that we're taking a hard look at right now, actually. So uh, thanks for your report, Chris. Great job. Thank you. Appreciate the questions. All right. Anything else? Trent, you good? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Right. This, the second half of the work session updates is uh, from Mr. Matt Blood, who will provide an update on two aspects of the uh, work that's happening in the student, excuse me, in the human and community services group. So um, you have had, you have access in the board book to the organization charts. And I don't know if you remember last year, I provided you with a copy of them um, because I, I found that other people were finding value in them. I, and really the, the history behind it was I was creating it so that I could understand who's where and what roles and where they fit in with the organization and and so forth and and i found that there's many people who have seen value in how they can do their work with these organization charts as well and sharing it with the board so that you can see that it's it's kind of a a work in progress it's always changing um and you if you were to compare this year's organization charts to last year's you would see some differences not just in people, but also in some shifting of positions based on need, um, based on um, student numbers and, and so forth with that. And it's just kind of a nice visual for, for myself to see that, but also for anyone looking at it to be able to see, okay, where is, um, where are people at and in what roles and in what buildings for that, those roles. And so you can see, um, throughout like at the middle school i'll get us to the middle school here um ritz made a shift because of our need for early, some of our littles to move over to ritz we move i mean over to red hawk we moved ritz over to the middle school because that was a good spot for them the the space that we had to um, provide them was actually a better fit for this program and so you can see that that is over now at the middle school. Um, you can also see, I, for my sake, seeing where people um, are to understand the house system and so forth. You can see that in the middle school too, where I've highlighted the teachers that are in the greenhouse, the teachers that are in the red house and so forth. So if you ever have a question of what is, uh, what grade level is the greenhouse or whatever, you can look on the chart and see that greenhouse is seventh grade, red house is seventh grade and so forth. Um, in in the chart itself. So it's just something that um, helps people to see. I know that payroll and, and uh, the finance department will tend to use a lot of this as well um, when it gets time to cutting checks, but it's also um, just good because it's a spreadsheet that it's feeding, that's feeding off of this into the charts. And so it creates some efficiencies in that as well. So just for your your benefit to uh, have that in board book on that. Um, we were busy with hiring this summer. And as you can see in the organization charts, there was a lot that um, was done and a lot of um, effort and collaboration that went into it all the way starting back in February when we were looking at sections and so forth. So 
I just want to show my appreciation for all of the people that were involved in from the from the get go from the planning of deciding on what sections where and what are we going to do and then you throw COVID into the mix and and it just creates a lot of um, a lot of busy work that needs to be done so that they can so that we can start the school year off right and it's administrators it's teachers it's it's students um, that were all involved in in the hiring of of our staff so that we could uh, have the best people in the right places so I really appreciate the work that was done by everyone with that the second thing that I want to share is um, and Scott had provided you with the one-page plan that the HR department is really working on and so when you when you look at this first I want to just acknowledge how simple this is in terms of um, viewing ability and being able to understand the flow of this and it's because of Scott's vision of what you know com combining two different types of strategic planning efforts and putting them into this one easy one page um, plan keeps it in front of us and um, I'm I'm quite excited to see the end result of um, the work that's going to be done and continues to be done um, through this plan so as I talk about this the the issue really is COVID and how do we respond to all of the the struggles that that everyone's dealing with on a daily basis and really much of our day is capitalized around COVID and um, so when I think of the human resources department and um, dealing with all of the situations that occur with staff with students um, the changes that our health department can kind of come up with um, that kind of stuff can start to really create some havoc and and create a mess that you know creates a lot of frustration out of it and so um, creating this plan I think we'll limit that, we'll keep the transparency, we'll keep the communication going, and really develop a lot of efficiencies that we, we have been working toward, but also developing, and hopefully we'll continue to build on um, moving forward. So there's really three, um, four areas that, that I was focusing on when I was talking with Scott about this uh, struggle in our coaching conversations is you know keeping the information accurate keeping it updated you know so every friday I, i'm starting to refer to that as fun friday because we're getting uh, every friday the county comes out with some little tweaks to the county protocols and to their guidance that they're giving to schools in the toolkit and you know some of them can be pretty um big changes and some of them are just little changes but regardless it's going to lead to the ineffective um, information that we are able to share with people and so we want to keep that up to date and we want to um, keep it accurate with that the other struggle that we can have is with tracking we have you know we've had to um, have a number of staff and students who have had to stay home um, because of the protocols that are in place with the with the county guidance and so if they meet some of those concerning symptoms that are in place um, they need to be presumed as being positive for COVID until they either have a negative test or they have a doctor's note that says that it's an alternative diagnosis you know it might be migraines it might be um, a known condition that that the doctor says, yeah, they're the same symptoms, but this is not COVID. If we have that documentation, they can come back earlier. Otherwise, we have to presume that they're positive and they have to be out the 10 days during, you know, that's required of someone who has a positive, um, been confirmed positive for COVID. Well, tracking that is, is easy at the beginning because we can have a lot of people who, um, are told your earliest return date is 10 days from the first symptom. They get tested and now they come back two days later because they're negative. 
And that's where some of the confusion and lack of communication can take place and buses may not let students on because they're supposed to be quarantining and, and they actually have been released to come back and they didn't know all that kind of stuff. So the communication um, part of the tracking needs to, to be more consistent in that regard. And thankfully we haven't really had that many con situations, but we're just planning and preparing for those situations so that we don't have those types of struggles. Um, the record keeping is another one. We have a lot of systems in our, at our access. We have PowerSchool, we have records, we have other um, things that, you know, Google, whatever. And the record keeping can kind of get out of hand and people need something that's gonna be consistent across the board from building to building and so forth. And so we need to just make sure that we're developing stuff and continuing to use the resources that we already have at our access. Um, so we're working on ways that we can um, use those to create greater efficiencies and um, as well as accessible to the stakeholders. And then lastly, the communication part, I kind of touched on that, but you know, we have a lot of people calling, we have a lot of emails, we have a lot of um, need for information and they need to have that, everyone needs to have that information. And so how do we update our system so that they can get their answers to their questions as soon as possible. And so um, when we talk about the Fun Friday, that triggers a lot of change that happens on my end um, for updating our website. So, and updating the student and staff FAQs so that they can have the most up-to-date information in there. Um, we have quick links for our administrators to be able to have forms and different things that need to be updated. And that's all that part of that communication that, that uh, we are working toward with this and um, making sure that it's up to date, but also communicating it out to the people so that when, I mean, we have secretaries that are answering the same question all day long because people need to know the answer to that. And is there a, is there a better way that we can get that information out to people so that we can have fewer phone calls so that we can have um, less need to have to go over the same stuff all the time, but with different people. So um, that's where we're gonna continue to monitor our, um, our work and doing that through surveys, doing that through qualitative and quantitative data gathering that's going to tell us, you know, how, what kind of job are we doing? What should we be um, concentrating more on and less on based off of the data that we get? And, you know, I think of, um, you know, phone calls, surveys, you know, that sort of stuff, but also how many other um, uh, hits on our website and stuff are there on this? Are we spending a lot of time on this page when no one's really going to that page? Um, or should we be promoting that page more and sending people to that or this video or, or whatever on that? So we're gonna be using some data to really tell us how successful we are in making this our, what the goal says is providing stakeholders with effective, efficient, accurate, timely resources regarding COVID-19. So that's the, that's the hope. It's gonna involve a lot of people, um, uh, administrators, our district leadership, our um, partnership with Spectrum through our health aides, um, technology and, and uh, HR, of course, our department is um, gonna be involved in some way throughout that process, not just myself on that. So I know I, I, didn't create such an excitement as the consensus revenue estimating conference, but um, are there any questions that I can answer for you guys? And I got a question. I think maybe a combination between you and Jen, but I remember when we did the when we did the the learning plan, we looked at you know the different channels between in person versus you know remote learning. Um, but I, I don't recall if somebody's home for their ten days. Is there still a way? For them, if they're feeling, I mean, they, they may have been exposed, but they may not be showing symptoms or maybe asymptomatic. 
Is there a way for them to stay still digitally in touch with their teacher, get copies of their assignments? Are we sending home paper packets? Or how are we making sure we don't lose those students um, that maybe, you know, for 10 days falling behind two weeks, that's a significant amount of time? Yeah, that's a good question, Trent. And I'll start it. And then Jen, if you want to jump in as well. But yeah, that is something that we are taking very seriously and making sure that we have a plan for that, not just for the student, but also for the staff member, you know. Um, so that's where I think Canvas really comes into play here and preparing, I mean, seeing the value of what Canvas can do for an in-person class alone is enough reason to, to have it. But uh, looking at what we can do with Canvas for a student who needs to quarantine or, you know, it, they might not, if, if a student is home because they have a household member that tested positive, by the county guidance, they have to be out for that 10 days plus 14 after that. So they could be out for almost 24 days if they don't have a way of being able to separate and be able to be approved by the county to have only 14 days. So we need something to keep them up with, with the class. And I think Canvas is the answer for that, but it's gonna take checking in and working from the teacher and from the school's um, side of it to make sure that the student stays on there. And it's gonna involve special ed if they are on an IEP and, or 504 or something like that. I don't know, Jen, if you have anything else to add. Just examples that I've heard of teachers who, as an example today, um, a secondary teacher shared with me that in one class he had eight students absent, in another he had six, in another he had five. So these larger pockets of students who are out for different slides of time, being able to still zoom in with their class for conversation, to be able to see clearly what the assignment flow is and know how to access that. Um, that's critical. And our teachers are doing the hard work of ensuring that that happens. Um, I've heard some great elementary stories of teachers collaborating in a way that, you know, you handle the math piece, I'll handle the science piece, and so that it all gets done and it's all um, in sync. I had an elementary principal share today that. Um, you know, teachers were like really excited about, about the fact that just think next year at this time, we'll have this all built and we'll just be able to refine it. Um, so it is providing some needed service right now, but some um, future efficiencies that we will be able to realize that are really in alignment with some of our flight plan goals that we may not have achieved quite as quickly. Um, and it's crazy to say, but without COVID. Yeah, I have to punch in real quick on that too and just say we've really broken down the barriers by having internet hotspots ready. We've created a process that goes through the building administrators so that if someone is an in-person learner but has to be out of the building for an extended period of time for that type of reason, they can get a hotspot for any multitude of reasons so they can connect you know, we have the one-to-one -one Chromebooks and technology uh, for each student. So, um, and that was all made possible by the board approving all those purchases. So great job. But, uh, there's no boundaries. We can make it happen. Yeah, Chris, I was actually, that was another question I was going to ask. So thanks, uh, um, Jen and Matt. Um, appreciate your answers there. The next question was really around how are we doing on our technology? Um, it sounds like uh, what Jen just shared is there's a number of students that maybe, you know, became absent for kind of an unexpected reason. They had signed up for in-person. And so obviously we're gonna have to get them technology. Are we, are we sitting in a pretty good place or are we at risk of exhausting those uh, uh, temporary loaner devices? And then I'm sure, I'm sure sterilizing between um, reissuing, but how, how are we doing on technology? Are we holding up? Um, as far as devices go, we are doing great. Uh, we, we have, again, students six through 12, everybody that wanted one, uh, which is my, my understanding, has a Chromebook, brand new Chromebook with the case. We're all set there. At the elementary levels, the Chromebooks are still in the buildings, but they're in the process of assigning them. And if a student does have to miss any time, they send one home with them, so they're all set. As far as hotspots, you remember we, we purchased the 300. Um, 
I currently have 81 that are out to families right now. So we still have just about 220 that are just waiting in the wings. They're, they're deactivated. They're not running a monthly charge right now. So we're all set there, uh, but they're just, they're ready for families that need them. So uh, we're in a good place. There's really, there's really nothing in, in our way at this point. So. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Just real quick, um, Jen had commented, I want to make the, the same comment that, uh, you know, really you as a group are setting up Cedar Spring schools for a future that was coming at some point. And you're doing it at an accelerated pace. You're putting processes and procedures in place now that would we'd have, we would have to do later. And it, I understand it's very hard work. And, and I just want to let you all know that we appreciate the heck out of, out of what you're doing. Uh, Matt, you're talking about trying to track this and record it and make sure everybody knows it. I understand how difficult that is, but just think about a year from now or two years from now, you know, you've set the groundwork for something that will go on forever in, in uh, Cedar Springs. And thank you so much. We appreciate that. Thank you. And I, I couldn't help but think about uh, couldn't help but think about that scenario where you have a family that moves out of the area because of a job, you know, a, a job for the parents, that student could continue to attend Cedar Spring schools with their friends uh, via online in the future. So that's kind of an interesting thing to think about the fact that, uh, you know, the, the rules have effectively changed, you know, and uh, the culture that we're fostering at Cedar Springs and, and students who like to be here aren't going to be forced to have to find a new school, even if they're, even if they're forced to move uh, geographic locations. Pretty cool. I, I did want to share. So um, you had a copy of the one page plan that I, I brought and gave to you. Um, but this is the other piece of the tool uh, kit. So uh, behind every one page plan, there's also what we're calling a mission log workbook. And so this is going to be the workbook. This is going to be the location for all the details to be logged and tracked. Um, it also serves as this is Matt's professional growth goal for the 2020-2021 school year. So not only is it serving the greater purpose of identifying and supporting district needs, but it's also tracking Matt's professional growth for purposes of his evaluation. And so these tools really are serving multiple purposes, uh, which is all a part of the greater flight plan system. And so everything that you'll see in the one page plan is also included in this workbook, but just in greater detail in the workbook. Uh, and so it's a work in progress. We get better every time we create uh, one of these documents. Um, and it's exciting to think that, um, you know, our, our, even though we're growing, um, the work is still uh, locked in on 21 key growth points, 21 key growth measures uh, that have been identified through data and approved by the board uh, to guide all of the work, all of the systems, all of the functions of the district. And so it really is a unique collection of tools and resources. And you know, you've heard me say it before, but we literally are just getting started which is so darn exciting. Um, I can't wait till we can walk into a kitchen uh, in any building in the district and see one of these up on the wall or to go to, you know, talk to, to Blaine uh, from, the, from Ken's team in his green truck and have Blaine have one of these shrunken down somewhere in the cab of, of his pickup. So, you know, it really unifies the efforts of the district. And, um, and again, we're just thankful for the opportunity to do this work. Any other questions? Okay, so Matt, thank you um, for that. And thank you to all the frontliners that are answering the phones and doing those pieces and May that can communication continue to grow because it's you know we're we're still 
they're the frontliners and people want to hear those voices. So that's important. So we thank them and we thank you for supporting that work too. Yeah, they're, they're doing a great job and it's, it's really something that um, wouldn't be possible without them answering the calls and, and principals sending out emails and taking calls from teachers and, and whatever at all times of the day and night to be able to keep that communication going. And, and so, unfortunately, we'll probably be in that mode for a little bit as we learn how we're going to live with this whole thing. So that's right. That's yep. right. So, okay. All right. Anything else for Matt before we move forward? Thoughts? Whinings? No complaints. Okay. All right. Good. Good. No complaints. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. So we'll move on then to our communication um, portion of the meeting. And for the Board of Education, I can start with the Kent ISB dinner is um, October 22nd. And it was an easy sign up. And it's never going to be any easier to go to one of those dinners is to jump on your Zoom and be there because it is virtual. So I just wanted to sh um, throw that out to you. And thank you, Trent, for the reminder. I did my little uh, Title IX training before the deadline. And that was, anybody, if you haven't seen it yet, it's a video. It's very informative, even just for your regular life. So there's that. So that's what I have for the board communication. Is there anything else from the board? I did my training too. I didn't print it off. Should I print the certificate off or just leave it? Well, I put it in my in my other work file too. Yeah. It's a nice little souvenir. Yeah. Um, yeah. But <laughs> I have record of everyone that's completed okay. it. So you don't need to do it for me, but yeah. if you would like a copy, that's up to you. Okay. Good for your resume. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Anything else from the board or I'll turn it over to Scott. Okay. Perfect. I've just got two quick things. So once, uh, one thing I wanted to share, the Kent ISD has put together a COVID-19 dashboard for districts to use. Uh, and so we're able to unify our reporting out uh, to our members of our community. This um, was actually built by the team at Kent ISD, partnering with the Kent County Health Department. So again, another one of those great uh, symbiotic uh, relationships that bring about benefit to both, both parties. So the tracker is pretty simple and the dashboard is pretty simple. Uh, we'll be putting this on our website. Um, so it's a matter of going up here to identify the, the, the uh, district. You click on the district and then you'll see that the data updates. Um, and so you'll see that right now we have, as of the 14th of September, we had one staff member that was identified uh, as a uh, reportable case. Um, so the, the tricky thing um, is going to be maintaining this data in an up-to-date format so it's meaningful. Um, and so the Kent County Health Department is gonna partner with the Kent ISD to maintain as populated of uh, data set as possible. Um, and so what they'll do is they'll update the data every Thursday. They'll give districts an opportunity to review it and check it. And then they'll go live with it every Monday. Um, and so that's going to be the track. It's never going to be real time um, because of the dynamics of the system. But this, this system will enable us to be in compliance with the most recent executive order. Uh, as, as put out by the governor. Uh, the other piece is that Spectrum Health and their uh, community health group is launching um, a school health social media series. There'll be four parts to the series. Uh, the first event is actually tomorrow night and they're gonna be talking about reducing risk and staying healthy uh, with, to prevent the spread of COVID-19 uh, specifically looking at uh, athletics and other, uh, other activities for students uh, that they're engaged with. The next one is going to be on mental health and online learning challenges. The third is on 
the flu versus COVID-19. And then the fourth in the series is on stay healthy and stay well. Um, the contributors to this series, there will be a number of experts from the medical community, uh, from the Kent County Health Department, and then Heidi Katula and myself will also be sitting in as representatives of the, uh, of the educational world. And so if you're interested in, uh, in participating or seeing any of those uh, events, you can tune into the Spectrum Health Facebook page, their Twitter feed, or their YouTube page to get access to those events. Um, and I'm anticipating getting some information soon, um, hopefully this evening, because the first event is tomorrow, uh, that we'll be able to share on our uh, Facebook page as well. So those are the only two things that I have as far as district communication. Okay, thank you. Does the board have any questions for Scott on any of that? Okay, well, we'll look forward to seeing you on Facebook then tomorrow night. <laughs> okay, all right. So planning going forward, we have our next meetings documented and I don't have the date in front of me, so I'm not going to say it but it's in our Red Hawk Weekly. And we will see what the state of the world is, um, whether we're going in person or we remain virtual as we approach each meeting. So, October 12th. October 12th, thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next meeting. All right, so with that, at my time says 7.36, we'll stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>